Minutes show. I'll be joined by Deputy Director at the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, Sefi Golzari Munro, and journalist and author David Wallace Wells. And we'll be discussing the solutions to the energy crisis and the latest emergency measures introduced by China to curb air pollution before the Winter Olympics. Hello and welcome back to The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. And we're getting straight to discussing the climate issues of the day now with Deputy Director at the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, Sepi Golzari Munro, and journalist and author David Wallace-Wells. So good evening to both of you. Nice to see you both. So, the solution to the energy crisis in the UK is not to drill for more oil and gas. That's what COP President Alok Sharma told us today, following repeated calls from some Conservative MPs to do just that. Well, international gas prices are sky high today, in part at least due to Putin's Russia restricting the flow. So what's the solution? Should every country be energy independent if possible, be that with oil, gas or renewables? Uh, Seppi, what do you think? There are some voices in the Conservative Party who say, get rid of green levies. People can't afford those at the moment because of uh, the squeeze on their incomes. They also say that we should increase the amount of gas that's being drilled for in the North Sea uh, to, to try to get over the energy crisis. Alok Sharma says that's not the way to go. Well, how much tension and split is there over this issue, not just in government, but, but more broadly, do you think? Honestly, Anna, I think it's a bit of a red herring. As Hannah said, it's a very small uh, minority of uh, Conservative MPs. Most Conservative MPs, indeed, most of uh, the, the British public uh, really support uh, climate action. It's the topmost concern uh, for the British public in, uh, you know, in, in the issues of climate and environment. So it really is a red herring. And I think the, the, the reality and the reality that most uh, serious politicians uh, who are looking at this issue understand is that it's our continued reliance on polluting fossil fuels that are dependent on the kind of uh, work of, <laughs> let's put it mildly, unfriendly regimes. So, you know, it's coming up for a year now since Putin's Russia began its latest round of geopolitical game playing, restricting gas supplies into Europe and contributing to the gas price spike. So actually the best way to reduce our energy bills is to reduce our reliance on gas by insulating our homes, uh, improving our housing stock and continuing to move towards the homegrown and clean and cheap re new renewables and the electricity system. Okay. Uh, and David, you're in New York at the moment, so what about the US point of view? How much consensus is there there about managing transition but keeping prices down for consumers? What's the picture there? Well, as I think is almost always the case on climate, we're a little less progressive in our collective outlook than you see in the UK or across Europe. But I think most energy experts would agree that the, um, the price crisis that we're seeing now, not just in the UK, but really all across the world, is not the result of climate policies. Um, drilling for more oil would not meaningfully address, um, and pr or producing more gas would not meaningfully address the short-term problem. Um, and if we're thinking about trying to build a smoother transition to a more stable energy future a decade from now, it seems pretty clear, I think, from, from all um, expert perspectives, that the, the best path to that is to radically expand our, um, our renewable build-out so that over the next five or seven or 10 years, um, we're not as dependent on um, petrol states like uh, like Russia or Saudi Arabia um, for our uh, energy needs. That's not to say that every country can or should go entirely energy independent, um, but it is. it does happen to be the case that the um, international alliances that renewable energy pulls you into tend to be alliances um, with socially and politically more friendly regimes um, who are less prone to this kind of gamesmanship. And I think as a result, um, a, a more renewable energy, say two or five year um, plan is gonna get us to a much better, okay. cheaper uh, place when it comes to energy. So Sophie, you'll both agree that renewables in future will make bills cheaper. Well, what about in the short term? What about now? Just insulating your loft isn't gonna keep people's energy prices, uh, energy bills much lower, is it? Well, actually we've had uh, the ECI, you've got a report out today that shows that if the UK government had continued with its plans to insulate homes, there were modest plans, uh, but nonetheless had continued with those plans, 9 million UK households would be paying £170 less 
on their energy bills this year. So actually the cost of not acting, of not insulating our homes has added an eye-watering amount uh, to people's bills and that's that's not insignificant and that's a modest proposal that was back in 2013 actually if you ramped up the insulation program you could reach many more households and significantly reduce their bills so i think there are uh, schemes that are very popular with the public that could be started and ramped up you know very very soon because we know that actually you know, experts say that the gas prices are going to remain high okay. for at least 18 months to two years. So we can make significant inroads if we actually just get the policies in place. OK, let's move on to our, our next issue now, because Chinese authorities are to impose dramatic emergency restrictions on polluting businesses and vehicles ahead of the Winter Olympics in order to avoid high levels of air pollution. The winter weather conditions are very unfavourable, according to Chinese authorities. So what does it tell us about their long term commitment to tackling air pollution? And, and David, first of all, tell us why air pollution in China is so bad. It was home to 42 of the world's 100 most polluted cities last year and that didn't even include Beijing which is having such problems with smog now yeah you know India is the, the, the country in the world with the worst air pollution problems but um, China is is um, not doing very well either largely it's because of industrial production and coal burning um, but it also has to do with weather patterns and um, and the, the urban density around um, old coal plants so they've actually tried to do some long-term planning they've moved a lot of that coal production away from cities which is one reason why many fewer people are dying from air pollution uh, now in, in Beijing um, than we're in 2013, 2014. Um, but as these measures show, it's obviously not sufficient to make even a couple of weeks um, comfortably, you know, reliably clear of not just, um, you know, unsightly, but, but lethal, potentially lethal pollution. Well, yes, and Sefi, what do you make of their step to, to get polluting companies to, to stop, uh, stop their business short term in order to get some results? What does it say about the effect of an international event like this, is it a force for good or is this just a, a short term fix and China will go back to its, its same habits as soon as it's over? I mean, it is an interesting point, isn't it? The fact that China clearly cares so much about international opinion that it's going to go to these great lengths to to clean up its act, albeit for a, a short time uh, before it finds itself hosting uh, athletes and media outlets. I mean, that's informative in and of itself. And I think we saw in the international climate process that China does care uh, about uh, global opinion and how it's perceived. So that could lead to a bit more of a virtuous cycle of peer pressure. Obviously, this is a short term, uh, you know, measure. Um, and, uh, you know, but these things can lead to some more embedded action in the future. Do you think that's right? Are you encouraged by it at all, David? I mean, or is it sort of greenwashing on an international stage? Because China's in a, in a strange position, isn't it? It's the, it's the most polluting country in the world, and yet it's also investing a huge amount in renewables. I think there medium-term view is that China's been tackling air pollution um, relatively aggressively by global standards. They're still far from the, the air that we would be happy to be breathing in the UK or the US, but they've made huge gains over the last decade and everything suggests that they're going to continue doing that. It's not sufficient. It leaves many people behind, um, but I don't think this is just a short-term greenwashing episode. They're trying to make themselves look best for a brief period, but the longer-term trajectory is encouraging. I would just point to the bigger picture. You just flashed a little graphic on the screen showing that um, the particulate matter in Beijing regularly exceeds WHO guidelines. 95% of the world has air that where the particulate matter exceeds the WHO guidelines. So while China is in a worse place than almost everywhere else, aside from India, this is not just a problem confined to China. It's a problem that we're seeing in London, in New York, all across the West, all across the developing world. And it's one we really need to be dealing with alongside the challenge of climate change. Well, yes, and Sefi, very briefly, we've been discussing just that with clean air zones being discussed, uh, expansion of them in London and, and Manchester as well in England. Um, I mean, do you think that Beijing's issues will, will highlight the problems of pollution, one that some people say isn't talked enough about? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's it's such a it's a factor that impacts so many people across the world, um, and you have seen uh, movements in the UK, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, uh, 
really trying to raise awareness about it but you're right it's not it's not up there um, as high as perhaps it should be on the okay. agenda given its severe negative impacts on health um, and so possibly this could actually you know with with the world's um, media and the world's eyes on Beijing could help really raise the issue. Okay. Fantastic. Well, Seppi Gozari Munro, David Wallace Wells, always good to talk to you both. Thanks very much indeed for your time. And tomorrow I'll be joined by.